Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. This is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee. Um, we will be doing a public hearing this evening. We are meeting at Gloucester High School, 32 Wesley O. Johnson Road, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you're watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap to, or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during public hearing to be recognized to speak. Um, I'll state that the mission for Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. Present, we have in person Superintendent Lummis, Keith Minio, Melissa Prince, myself, Kathy Clancy, Sam Watson, and Bill Minio, and Recording Secretary Maria Puglisi. And joining us on our screen, Amy Pascarello, brand new Assistant Superintendent. Hello. Um, good evening. Okay, so I ask that you join me in the salute to the Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so this evening we are doing. Um, uh, the topic is updating school attendance zones. Uh, we will begin with the presentation by the superintendent. Um, and then hopefully that will answer some questions if people have them. And, uh, and then we will move on to the public hearing portion of the meeting. We will not be voting this evening. If anybody is concerned that we um, are taking a vote this evening or not, we'll take public comments. We'll think about it and we'll vote at a future meeting. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair, Chair Clancy. Um, so uh, before I jump into this presentation, um, I want to just uh, say a couple of things. First, trying to, so uh, as folks, I hope know, we, uh, the sort of primary impetus for updating school zones is the opening of the new school a year from now. And uh, because the current zones or the current schools of East Gloucester and veterans combined don't would fully utilize the new school we need to and, and we've known this for quite some time um, adjust the school zones to make sure we, we fully utilize that school um, that target enrollment is 440 students as we've described before you know it'll take some time to get there whenever a new school opens it, it takes a few years for it to get to full enrollment um, but one way uh, we need to make sure we move that direction is to have a school zone for that school um, uh, is is you know sufficient size basically it will pull in our students. Um, that has allowed us to also take the opportunity to make a few other adjustments in the zones because of some of the um, sort of just anomalies that develop over time with any school zones and we'll describe those tonight. I'll describe those tonight. So let me just jump into the presentation and the um the moment here. So the intention tonight is to give folks, the school committee, obviously, again, uh, update on the, on the proposed um, change, um, on the proposed update of the school attendance zones, but also for folks who are listening um, as well uh, before the public comment opens. So just so go over a few things here, just the headlines. So as I said, uh, we're tr trying to make as small a number of changes as possible in the actual uh, streets and which schools they go to. Uh, we're aiming to make uh, more sensible and contiguous school attendance zones because right now there are a uh, few of them are disconnected. Uh, said, as I mentioned, utilize the, the new school building fully, uh, impact the fewest possible people. So in this case, West Parish remains the same because of its location, EGS and Vets remain primarily the same, except for, of course, as I said, we will add um, some streets uh, to, that, to, those, to that school zones. Um, also able to reduce the length of the longest bus rides first families going to Beeman and Plum Cove. And also the adjustments help us balance socioeconomic, um, help us help the socioeconomic balance significantly. Um, I'll talk more tonight about the three-year time frame to transition to the, and fully enact the tennis zones. Um, and then sort of describe a little bit more about what grandfather means. So 
Um, before I get into the details of the changes, do want to describe in a little more detail what the three-year transition to new school zones you know, looks like. And, and, and then later in my presentation, I'll go over a few scenarios just to illustrate how it might work out for specific families. Um, so the transition period begins 2023-24. In a couple of conversations we've had with families, some folks were concerned it'd be happening this school year and it's not. Um, if the school or when the school committee votes on updated zones, then um, that then the transition period begins next year. So that means that any family can start can change schools next year in their new school if they would like to. But uh, if not, then um, we'll work with them on a three-year um, you know, period to figure out what, what works best for their families. Um, so that means any student in second grade or higher could complete the elementary school at their existing school. So any, any students in second grade right now, so either third, fourth, and fifth, okay. But any families that have students on who live on the streets that are impacted. That are in second or third or fourth grade, they wouldn't be impacted. They're not, there's, there's no change for them. We are able to offer transportation during the transition period. So for three years in the currently existing zones. So for example, if you um, were uh, Beeman School and you just, and you get and you have transportation, you get bus transportation where you live now, and you're switching to, to Plum Cove, you continue to get transportation um, to Beeman for the next three years. Uh, or you know, until you switch there. If you if you switch the after you know, one, two, three, three, you'll have transportation for three years. Um, those families with students in kindergarten, first grade, or or have younger siblings who aren't yet in our public schools um, will have up to three years to transition to their new school. Um, and as I said before, we'll work with family, those families uh, individually, case by case, um, after the school committee votes uh, in October, November, or maybe into December, to develop what the transition plan that fits best for each family. Um, and the families can move all or some of their students to new school depending on their current grade and their current situation. So again, um, trying to do this in a way um, that limits the impact on families, but also really want to acknowledge that any impact at all is significant for that family. You know, our jobs are to balance the needs of the whole entire school system um, and really look at it from that, that sort of broader perspective, but at the same time really acknowledge and understand that even if, you know, um, if, if a family has to move, that's hard for the family. You know, there's no denying that, um, but try to make it um, as limited as possible by having a transition period, by not forcing folks to, to, to move who are at older, older students in elementary school, uh, by offering transportation, that sort of thing. So again, so let me go into some of the specifics here. Um, I mentioned about the real driver of this is opening the new school, but also we, you know, realize over time as folks, you know, um, Adjustments have been made that uh, were a little out of balance in terms of a significant out of balance in terms of socioeconomic levels. So, just in terms of the process for folks who may not, who just started tuning in, maybe June 8th, uh, earlier this year, we shared criteria with the uh, school committee about what we would do and how we would do the attendance zones uh, updates and review. August 3rd, we get an update on the work we completed. September 14th, presentation of the proposed uh, zones. Uh, since then, we've been reaching out quite a bit. I'll talk about that uh, to families, to those families on affected streets. School committee public hearing is scheduled for tonight, obviously. And then at this point, um, school committee is considering, uh, scheduled to consider a vote on the zones next week. So, um, these are just, I won't go through these, but just the criteria for updating school attendance zones. These, as I said, were, were shared in, in June. Um, maximizing enrollment in the school building, provide target relief to schools and ways to space and class size. We want to make sure that. Um, you know, our, our buildings, especially the, the newer ones, um, which have you know, larger classrooms and, and more modern facilities are being fully utilized. We want to maintain and will maintain small class sizes across the system. We want to make sure that uh, schools have similar size classes across the system as well. Uh, maximize geographical continuity of each tenant zone, uh, less than socioeconomic disproportionality, and also into transportation, transportation when we're doing this. So, um, so I think that the, the, the proposal actually hits a number of these you know, head on. And, um, and also another important one is minimize, minimize the impact on current students or you know, through getting brought in there, just, just, just describe that. So, um, so that was, again, what we, that's what, this is what's been guiding our work on it. Um, I won't go into what we've been doing, um, but we've been a, a lot of um, you know, mapping of where students live, mapping of where students have been born, um, looking at enrollment projections, 
um, in the past. So, you know, trying to predict as best we can where students live, where they will live, and then therefore um, what size uh, the schools, the new schools, school zones would be, and what size schools they produce. So, um, a fair bit of work, you know, going back in the springtime and throughout the summer. Uh, we've also met uh, with the city planning director to understand where you know, new growth may happen in, 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 in housing. Uh, and also work with the transportation director to uh, to establish that we will be able to um, allow or provide transportation for three years. These are just slides that, that I won't go into detail. I showed this earlier, but this is really just showing uh, sort of a pretty stable uh, elementary school population we've had over the past 10 years. Because it's stable, we're able, it helps us with our projections of what, about what size the schools would be. Um, it doesn't give us clear, you know, crystal clear answers. No one has a crystal ball on these things, but it does show that you know, we're not going up and down and changing all the time. So um, the numbers we use are, are pretty consistent and, and expected to, to continue that way. Um, this just shows that our incoming uh, kindergarten, cl kindergarten classes should be similar in the, in the upcoming five years to the ones we've had the last five years, um, except for uh, the class uh, that would come in that was uh, born during the COVID year, um, the initial the first COVID year that um, impacted uh, pregnancies and births. Um, and so there's just fewer students, fewer kids were born in Gloucester that year. You see 217 down here in the bottom row, and that's obviously smaller than, um, than, the, than the previous years by a fair bit. So, but that's another impact in the pandemic. So let me get into the updates and, and where we're going with this. Um, so just uh, first, before I get that, I want to just talk about the communication outreach that has happened since September 14th. Uh, I think we've done quite a bit to make sure folks are aware, especially those folks who are, who are on the impacted streets. Uh, I met with the parent leaders group and they helped us you know, um, come up with a few additional ways to communicate, email you know, all K to five families. We sent a specific email message to those on the, on the affected streets. Most of our families, uh, upwards of 80, 85% aren't impacted at all by this. 80, 85% aren't impacted at all. Um, I mean, they don't live on the impacted streets. Um, so those who are on the impacted streets, we, we sent specific email messages to. Um, and then we also called all of them, make sure they knew about it. and also knew about the public, public hearing tonight. We've got individual outreach to English learners, English learner, families of English learners as well, phone calls. Um, Announcement on Facebook, article of Gloucester Times. So just a whole variety of, and then tonight I met with the Beeman PTO, and next week I'll meet with the Club Code PTO. So just trying to make sure folks are aware of it, they understand the impact, <coughs> understand the proposal, um, and get their answers, their questions answered. And also so we can really understand and hear the concerns. Um, just a, a little bit of input from the public input form. So one way we've um, uh, enabled people to, to give input uh, is through a web-based form. You can see here that, um, that there have been 29 responses, all told, um, from different schools. And we asked folks what, where they attend schools now. Um, you see that uh, 10 folks are, you know, their zones are changing from Beeman to Plum Cove, 14 from Plum Cove to Beeman, and then four from Beeman to Cross for Vets. Um, and then a variety of, of, of responses. Um, positive responses were nine, and then ex folks expressed concerns were 17. 13 of the folks, we, we, we um, had a question there was if you wanted to um, get a follow up phone call or have a conversation about um, your concerns or what you put in there, um, you know, put your name and contact information. 13 folks and been able to follow up with them, either one of the principals, uh, myself, or our community engagement coordinator, Mike Gaffney, had had conversations. I believe that it's one of all folks who, who requested that. So just trying to, again, understand those concerns um, and make sure that they. Um, you have, have uh, you know, answer the questions basically. So just a few things in terms of projections with the new zones, when they're fully enacted, we were, we're, we're projecting that this would be the size of the schools, okay? So you see the, 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 the second row here, if you have 20 students per class, that's the number of students you have each, each of our schools, okay? Um, we don't project that we need classes that are 20, which are still very are small for elementary, but that, that on average we have classes a little bit smaller than that, which is great. That's, that's fantastic on all levels. Um, the current enrollment is there. So for example, 324 for Beeman, 215 for Plum, uh, 371 for West Parish, and then combined for 383 for EDS Vets. And I said that the new school has a larger capacity. 
So while we're, we'll you know make sure that that school is being used fully, um, the other schools we anticipate um, you know, a little bit smaller enrollment. It's great. Um, those are just some of the projections in terms of how we're looking at it and how we're, we're anticipating getting getting the schools a little bit down in size. You know, three of the four. And then this is important. I mentioned that a better this we, we expect it will result in a better socioeconomic balance. You can see that across the schools right now, from this is last year's data, we don't have this year's data yet. Um, you know, there's a range of 62% of students at Beeman who are uh, low income families, um, and then down to 33% at Plum, West Paris at 38, and UGS Fences at 52 uh, combined. So, um, again, with these limited number of adjustments, that balance is out pretty significantly. Um, and that helps with resources for schools. Um, it helps with uh, you know, uh, classes, that sort of stuff, and then also um, in terms of needs of students. So uh, that's a better balance across the, across this year. We've done a fantastic job. The, um, I say we, it wasn't me, it was started well before I got here, of making sure all of our elementary schools have um, the same curriculum, really the same approaches on individualized instruction and, and individualized support. Um, we're working now to make sure they all have the same approach on social emotional learning and skill development. Um, you have, you know, great teachers in all of our schools. And so really, um, you know, really believe that with our schools operating on the way they do so consistently across the, across the board that um, all of our schools have great leadership, personalized attention, and great support as well as quick instruction. So um, let me just, uh, I'll look at it. Well, look at the map last year. Um, four areas are impacted. I'll look at, I'll show those in a moment. And then these are the list of streets, and we've been very public about this, been able to um, you know, let people know about it. Um, these are the streets that if you uh, go to uh, Beeman now, you live in these streets, um, uh, your zone is changing to Plum Cove. These are the streets that if you tend Beeman now and live on any of these streets, or these particular parts of these streets, that your new zone will be the aspects of the new school. Uh, and these are the streets where you're currently zoned for Palm Cove and you switch to Beeman. I mentioned through your transition period, and it's just again there, um, look at that. And the last piece here is um, just some sample situations. These are just to illustrate the point of what we mean by the three-year timeline. So I'll start at the bottom. In the, the, the red row, this is a family with a first grader, third grader, and kindergarten at Beeman. The new attend, attend zone would, would be the EGS Vets, the new school. Um, they want to move all their students to new school next year. They're, they'd be, they'd be, happy, they'd be welcome to do so. Okay. Um, and so they would, they would decide to uh, you know, start all three students in uh, EGS Vets fall 2023. That's just you know, one scenario. Um, in the blue, this is a family with a first guard, first grader, kindergarten, and also a four-year-old, four-year-old. So the four-year-old obviously isn't isn't in school yet. Their new attendance zone is Plum Cove. So the question is then is, is when do we help this family transition? And that's going to um, involve principal or myself, you know, working with the family to determine what year is the best year to transition to Plum Cove. They may want to do it uh, you know, in the first year, they may want to do it uh, in the third year. But uh, really, may, may depend on their family. May depend on transportation. Um, it's hard for us to know without talking to each family what's best for them. Okay. And then the, the top one, the green one, this would be students who have, you know, um, kids are already in elementary school, a fourth grade, second grader at Beeman. Um, the new tennis zone is Plum Cove. But in this situation, if they didn't want to move, they wouldn't have to. They, their kids can both kids can finish um, elementary school at that school. So we just um. Uh, so then this is, I already said this, is that at this point, schedule is to have a public hearing tonight, and then school committee would have consideration of vote and adoption a week from now. Let me just finish by showing the map, which tells, um, which often will just makes things a little bit clearer in terms of the scope and scale of what we're talking about. So let me zoom out first. You can see with the new approach to the zones, things are very clear, clear boundaries, clear, clear, um, you know, just sections of this of the city. The green is all West Parish, that's the same. EGS and vets are combined in the purple. 
um, with additions down here. I'll zoom in in a moment. The yellow is Beeman, um, and then the sort of the pink, red is all Plum Cove. What you have now is you have Beeman, Plum Cove, West Parish, EGS, that's all downtown. We've sort of cleaned that up quite a bit um, to make them continuous, contiguous, you know, all linked. Um, and then also, I said, you know, reduce the longest bus rides for Beeman and Plum Cove families. So let me zoom in here so folks can see the four families. So we have a point area. So this area here um, has been you know, disconnected. Uh, two different schools. This part, uh, Wheeler Point, um, Wheeler Ave, and, and, and that, that neighborhood have been uh, have been beaming. They'll switch to Plum Cove, um, Patriot Circle, and Veterans Way. This has been um, all beaming, so we'll uh, we'll split that. Um, so part will go to Beeman, Part will stay at Beeman, Part will be switched to Plum Cove. Um, in the area around Milton Square here, and then also uh, Gloucester Ave and Poplar. That's now P Plum Cove. It's, it's you're driving past Beeman to get to Plum Cove. Um, it's very close to Beeman. Uh, so we're gonna make that um, all, all one zone coming down across into downtown for Beeman. So it's all connected zone. Um, so every child in this family would be going to Beeman. And then down here, this is the area at the beginning of Washington Street and either side of Washington Street that um, will be taken, uh, go from Beeman to ETS Vets. Um, and that makes um, makes it so the school we anticipate the school to be fully utilized. Stop there. Happy to answer any questions from the committee. Anyone have questions? And is it po is it is it possible that a street could be cut in half? I mean, one one end of the street, one school, one one end. Is that yes, yeah, and that's the way it exists now. Especially, I mean, long obviously, Washington Street is that makes yeah, any yeah. sense. Um, but uh, there are uh, a few places like that. Try to lessen that with this approach. Um, but if I, um, if, if you just look at the, if I can find these, you'll see on the where the streets are changed. Yeah. Uh, the listing of the streets, you might see numbers there. Yeah. Um, and that those are the ones that have you know. Um, Kind of split. Then. Yeah, kind of split. Yeah. But typically those will be in, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, sort of the, the longer the streets. Right. Um, but, you know, not, not all of them are. Yeah. Some stuff like yeah. I didn't know if that was going to say you refresh my memory on how we determine space for intra district school choice? Yeah, so by by school group policy, every year um, in the springtime, we determine, we look at that and, and determine sort of based on, um, you know, what it says is, is the class size targets, which are yeah. big. Um, and aren't clearly defined, as far as I can tell. Yeah, but that's really only for high school. Yeah, in terms of in terms of um, it's also twenty five. I believe is what yeah, it says, right? So, um, you know, we, we don't want to go there in elementary school. Right? We're not anywhere near that in elementary school. That's really sort of how it's uh, it's determined on an annual basis. You know, school by school, grade by grade. Um, but for the most part. Those requests focus in on, on, on entering kindergarten. That's where the vast majority of any school choice is happening. Um, and so we, um, in that situation, typically in any in any any grade, really, I'm already looking at you know, twenty. Okay, um, because we have, especially the earlier you accept folks in the school choice, the more likely you'll have people move into that zone, and during during the upcoming years, the, the ensuing years, and so. Um, if we get, if we accept students in a school choice in a school, let's say West Parish, because this is what happens, and you get kindergarten for 2021, then you are likely to have, as those kids continue on, uh, some kids will move in, who live in the zone, okay? And now you're looking at classroom sizes of larger, so the one thing we have at West Parish right now in a couple of the upper grades. And so, you know, going forward, we have to really look closely that we do at the kindergarten level, especially, uh, I think we're a little more precise in terms of a little more, I'd say, a little more. Um, well, just just 
aware that we can't create with if with school choice students, okay, getting into 2021, you can't fully load it at kindergarten, uh, except for if it's with kids in that zone. You have to do it with kids that they live there, right. if they go there, right? Um, but I think um, we've loaded kindergarten classes with school choice students, meaning, meaning got them up to that threshold, 2021, by adding two, three school choice students, I think that has gotten us in some difficult situations. So I guess that what I'm saying is I think going forward, we've got to be a little more diligent about, um, about choice because we don't want them to do that. And just to press a little bit further, and I just yeah. need a quick response because I, I haven't looked at this policy in a while. Um, once a student is accepted into the intra-district school choice, do they have the right to stay in that school regardless of how many um, students come in from that district? They do, and that's also the case. Um, yeah, yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. I just couldn't remember, so I just wanted to be clear on that one where having these conversations. Just to kind of dovetail into that, Melissa. So you, what we're saying is that it's difficult. If a child or a student choices into West Parish, and all of a sudden we get an influx of people in West Gloucester that are sending their kids to West Parish, that choice in students still has will still stay there. That's what. That's what Ben's doing. Yeah. You know, I, in terms of that. Yeah. 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 That's okay. Yeah. Um. So how much um, does social, 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 socioeconomic uh, balance factor into the redistricting, uh, the bus zone? Yeah, it's a pretty small part of that. Okay. Yeah, of that. I mean, the, 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 you know, the criteria, that, that was sort of, in some ways, where just so happens that we're able to balance that quite easily with, with a very little number of moves. You know? mm -hmm. um, and so that's actually sort of a, I think an added benefit. Okay. You know, um, you know, uh, it it just takes you know, um, it's kids who um, have yeah. It, it, it's it just there's a lot of things. How do I say this? I think it's um, sensible and sensitive. Um, It's challenging to educate kids for lots of reasons. Okay. Um, poverty, and growing up in poverty, or growing up in trauma, or growing up with, with um, special needs, or um, folks who are learning new language. Okay. That's just it, it, their additional services, which are, which are needed. Not always, but for many kids on average, which is really important. It's really important for us to pay attention to that and notice that and, and, and make sure that we provide any support. And service that a child needs, no matter who they are, where they come from. Um, but for example, the state funding formula acknowledges, and we generally acknowledge that there are often more complications coming, more support and service are need for students in specific groups. Okay, that's not a blanket statement, um, but and so that's but that, that does uh, to often happen. And so by um, having better balance in our schools, it also allows us to provide better support to our students, all students. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's, that's sort of the basis for wanting to achieve better balance when you can. In many places, it's very, very hard to do that. You know, um, Gloucester is actually, you know, very diverse community socioeconomically, which is one of our strengths in so many ways. Um, and uh, as I showed that the, the schools are um, out of balance and by uh, making some small number of changes we're actually we project that we can, can, can find better balance. So I think that's an important, um, important uh, shift to make. Yeah, I just, um, that, that, that's a good clarification. I, I do appreciate that. So, so if I understand, um, you know, it's, there are certain challenges that are more often associated with people with uh, in a lower economic background than say more, you know, more economically advantaged children that may not have those, but you know, I wouldn't say that's unique to low income people that have significant challenges. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's also again, again, speaking general generalities would not want to generalize yeah. because you know 
Okay. Um, students who are vulnerable come from every neighborhood, and from and, and I don't mean just Gloucester. Every mm -hmm. neighborhood, every type of family, every type of background. Um, that's that, that's that's the truth. Okay, but uh, and also um, it's shown again. I mean, growing up uh, in poverty or with trauma or um, is yeah, really impacts families in major major ways, and it can often make it more difficult. Um, for, you know, and, and produce you know, kids who have additional needs. Right? Um, so, sort of, you know, not having that all rely on, like, say, like one particular element, elementary school with, with like higher burdens for, for reaching kids, educating them. Yeah, more services, more support. And, and, and so, and so, you know, what's what's crucial, and I think also as well, and we continue to do better, is that we really understand that. Yeah. You know, so we develop systems and practices in all of our schools support kids wherever their needs are. And that's what we've talked to you about in terms of a very individual approach to analyzing and understanding the child, assessing them regularly. So we know, you know who they are, how they learn, how they learn best, but also the support they need, no matter who they are or what neighborhood they come from. So yeah. we do that for all students. Yeah. Um, and that I think is one of the reasons we have, you know, real strength and real um, consistency across our schools. Yeah, you know, from what I heard here, what you were saying before, you were, um, you know, our, our goal is to essentially level, you know, the services across all elementary schools to, to provide the same services for everyone. So, yeah, but in the, in the service that each child needs, really, yeah. you know, but and and, and no one's well enough, so we you know adjust those services for for you know supporting teaching instruction sort of stuff. Um, that's not easy to do, but I think our elementary schools do um, a very good job of that because they're very systematic about it and they go about it with a lot of heart, a lot of um, understanding, um, and also just a lot of um, you know, rigor. Brian, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and it has to do with the numbers for um, West Parish, which um, you say West Parish is not impact, it doesn't have really any changes, but I'm noticing the enrollment going down from 371 to 331 on projected mm -hmm. and i'm curious um what drives that so a couple things um big uh, births you know in terms of fewer births in the area so we project some 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 lower lower pieces there um it also may shift it also may see that because of it having higher school choice numbers right now and those might that those might go down the other piece about that is in terms of the development that we're seeing um, the most likely development is in west parish in terms of things that are already in the pipeline so right, while the projections show a, a, a smaller, it's very likely that that'll be balanced out with some increases. So I don't expect that. Um, I don't think we'll have a concern about West Parish being under the yeah. Okay. Any more questions? So we, we're gonna, um, I don't have Jonathan Scaffold. I would not use it if I did. Um, we'll open up the public hearing. Um, and I will. Okay. So, notice for, um, to people who would like to speak, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand. Um, please state your name and address clearly. Um, if you do have a prepared statement that you want to email our recording secretary, um, her email is mpuglisi, P-U-G-L-I-S-I, at gloucesterschools.com. Um, okay. All right. Any other time limits or? Oh, yes. You have up to three minutes. And we have a lot of attendees. I'm sure there are a lot of people on that want to speak, but I assume there's a lot of people also who really want to hear the presentation firsthand as well. Um, so it's nice to have everybody here. Um, so if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Um, first person is Chelsea Eunice. Hi, good evening. And I just first want to thank the school committee for holding this open forum and just for being willing to listen to our concerns and questions. Um, I do want to thank especially Superintendent Lummis for your vision to bring more educational equity just to Gloucester and also just to, to making the school zones make sense. Um, so again, my name is Chelsea Eunice. I'm a, I've been a public school teacher for the last 16 years. 
and I serve in schools with high populations of students with special needs and low-income families, um, but I'm also a parent of a second grader at Plum Cove, and he will be able to stay at Plum Cove for the rest of his elementary school career, but I also have a, a preschooler at the Gloucester Preschool, so he would be moved to Beeman. So we are definitely impacted by this decision. Um, my husband and I bought our home five years ago, knowing that our children would be able to attend Plum Cove. Um, I serve on the instructional leadership team at my school, and I've looked at MCAS scores for years. And so I looked at the MCAS scores. I looked to see what schools were NACI accredited, and that was very important to us and our family. And so um, we chose to, to buy a, a home in the district of, of Plum Cove. Being moved to Beeman, um, my, my concern is just the issue of the lack of student growth and achievement um, on the MCAS scores over the last few years. And I'm not saying that by any means to be disrespectful to the teachers or the families of that school or the leadership. Again, I work at a school that has failing MCAS scores. So I know that there can be great teachers and leadership at the schools, but I also know that sometimes MCAS scores are a reflection of some, some strong issues with the, with the tier one curriculum and with just alignment across grades. So, and I also think that moving students simply from one school to another won't correct the disparity in the academic performance. And I think every child, not just my children, every child deserves a high quality education across the, the city of Gloucester and across, of course, our state. Um, I just have many questions that I hope can be addressed in the future, but my, my most important one is, what reassurance can you give us as parents that there's a strong whole school improvement plan in place and how transparent is that process going to be for, for parents? Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for your comments. Can we, um, did she state her address to the end? Yes. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Chelsea. This is Gloucester Avenue. Sorry. Thanks. Thank Um, does anybody else wish to speak? Uh, Amy Orlando? Hello? Hi, uh, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Amy Orlando, and I reside at 22 Acacia Street. Um, I thank you all for holding this forum tonight. My family is very saddened to hear of the rezoning and how it will affect our children. My daughter is a first grader at Plum Cove and I also have a preschooler that will be attending soon. It is quite disappointing that the documents state that this is impacting a limited number of families as though those families that are being impacted will be fine or just don't matter. Why isn't this shift affecting West Parish at all to help with the balancing of socioeconomic status even further? There are already buses to West Parish on this side of the bridge. So I'm assuming that transportation was not the reason. If you're trying to maximize attendance to the new school, would it make sense to open up school choice to those families that would like it to East Gloucester Vet School? Tonight, you mentioned that school choice families might have the right to stay. And is, is this regardless of the redistricting that's happening? What is your plan with the school choice siblings? Why wouldn't my child have the right to stay at Plum Cove or other children that want to stay at Plum Cove or Beeman and have their sibling attend as well if the school choice option still remains. If this does get voted through, is school choice an option for families after the three-year period? If not, what measures do you have in place to support students that are being displaced from their home school? Will you ensure that they have a day in June to visit their new school, perhaps on a bus together so that they understand who else is attending with them? Will they be able to tour the school and meet the new teachers? Will there be a time for the children to meet the current children that will be in their grade level? so that they can maybe see some familiar faces? Will there be any guarantees that they, are, that they will have peers from their current school in their classes at the new school? Lastly, you mentioned trauma in a, a few times tonight. What is the plan to train staff at Plum Cove and Beeman in trauma-informed care? I'm extremely concerned about the social emotional impact that this shift will have on children and hope you consider the feelings of these children. My hope is that you will deeply consider the well-being for the students in the district that we all call home. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, next person is Mary Ann. Name and address, please. Hi, thank you, Kathy. Mary Ann Albert Boucher, 93 Mount Pleasant Avenue. Um, ben, you just spoke of the development at West Parish that it's projected 
but can you explain what happens if in the very near future, the MBTA TOD overlay passes and we have a sudden increase um, with the development and the increased units in that half mile radius that they speak of at many of these meetings. There's also 30 units um, anticipated for Maplewood Avenue. So I'd like to ask, since the new school, EGS Vets, or whatever the new name will be, was slated for 440 students, you are now saying 480 students. What happens if there's a sudden influx of um, many more than that? Because the units, from what I understand, um, that could be increased in this half mile radius. Radius, um, They can't put a number of how many people can live within those units. You may have a two bedroom apartment and you may have up to five children living in that um, two bedroom unit apartment. So do you have a plan in place um, projected for, for that area, that half mile radius? That, with the MBTA TOD overlay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to clarify one thing just that sure. um, we're not saying that the 480 students in the new school, it's still 440. That's what we're anticipating as we're building towards. Okay, just to clarify that. The 480 was simply doing if you have 20 students per class, and you would be at 480, but we're aiming for 440, just as we've always said. So, and then also, um, I can. At the end, I can talk more about the development if you folks would like. Um, anybody else like to speak? Plenty of you. We have 40 people, 48 people um, so far on this call. Heather Numerosi. I, did you hear where I was? Sorry, we have echo. Someone's got to shut up. We're sitting down with family. Um, so Chelsea and Amy addressed a lot of my concerns. I have a lot of the same concerns as they do. I've been sick to my stomach. Um, my son had a really tough time adjusting these past couple of years in Plum, I'm absolutely relieved that he can stay where he is for so many reasons. But my daughter now becomes my main concern. Um, I think siblings should stay together for social reasons, logistic reasons for my family. Uh, after COVID, we had some social adjustment struggles in our family. Um, and they were felt throughout our entire family. And it's really important for, for me to have them get the same learning experience. And while my mind swarms with questions, a few of the most important are, I keep, I hear all this about, there's gonna be new systems and learning plans to make sure every school is at the same level, curriculum wise, support wise. Why isn't that being done first before kids are forced to move to a different school? Um, another question is, if only 15% of families are impacted, why can't their siblings just stay together? Like how many families exactly would be separated? Is that number large enough to skew the whole plan? Um, yeah, those are mainly my two, my two main concerns. I just really want my children to be able to stay together. Uh, thank you. Can I have your address, please? Oh, Mr. Roshi, we just didn't get your address. Uh, Washington Street. I'm 206. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to speak? There we go. Um, Patty? 
Hi, I'm Hattie Holland. I live at 16 Acacia Street. Um, uh, Amy actually said a lot of the things that I would have liked to have said, and my biggest concern was how I felt my family was being addressed in terms of this change, you know, affecting such a limited number of people as if it was no big deal when to our family, this is obviously a huge deal and uh, really upsetting. Plum Cove has been our home. My son is in fourth grade. My daughter is in first grade. Their teachers, that community, it means the world to them. They love it there. And my son gratefully would be able to finish out his fifth grade year, but my daughter would be forced to move. And either we would have to move her immediately so that she could adjust better and then have two children in two different schools or keep her there for another year, knowing that I'm gonna have to pull the plug once she's gotten that much further in with a group of friends she loves, with teachers she loves, with people who mean the world to her. I I really, I, I would, would like to understand where that three year time frame came from. And I didn't know that until I reached out to our principal directly. I didn't know that there was a, a three year time frame being proposed. Um, that would have been really helpful kind of initially on the onset. And I also, I don't know much about the, I, I had heard at some point that there was a plan to combine Plum and Beeman. I don't know if that's still a, a plan down the road in the future for Gloucester, but I, I just, I wonder again about that and the timeline for that and whether this change really needed to happen now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Okay, I don't see any more hands. Oh, oh Adam Orlando. Adam, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, you have to unmute. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. How you doing? Uh, again, thank you very much for everyone uh, having us tonight and let you know everyone answer their questions and speaking. Um, my daughter, I know Amy just spoke. Uh, my daughter attends Plum Cove and had a you know quite an adjustment um, period last year and now finally settled, feeling like she's part of a family. Uh, the principal at Plum Cove is amazing. Her two teachers the past two are uh, amazing. Um, she's going to be in fifth grade in a few years. And it sounds like she's in first grade now. It sounds like when she goes to fifth grade, she will have to move to beam at school and her brother will be in first grade in two years. And then after that, we'll have to move to beam and after along with that. I'm not sure if I'm understanding what's going on and how this adjustment is going to work, but we we need, I think better clarification. I think everyone needs better clarification how this is going to work as a as a shift and why do they need to move at such a young age and not have to be impacted until they go to sixth grade. They move to a new school in sixth grade, not in elementary school. That they're, they're beginning their social lives, the teachers of you know they understand their teachers and their schools. But I really think you know this is where really impact a lot of children, even though it's only fifteen percent of the district, I really think we have to think about this decision and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And Julie Borch, if I got, if I pronounced that correct. Hi, I'm Julie Borch. I am a grandmother and my daughter is um, Heather Numerosi on 206 Washington Street. She just spoke. So this will significantly impact our family. I want, I would love my grandson and my granddaughter to stay together. She will be starting Plum Cove in the new year kindergarten and my grandson will be in third grade. So I assume he gets to stay there. But I really see the importance of siblings to stay together. And that's all I need to say because I am just so totally upset about this. I think it's wrong, and I hope you do consider this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julie. Thanks for speaking. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Oh, Heather, you wanted to speak again? <laughs> Heather, have you unmuted yourself? Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. I forgot to mention that when I was younger, I actually switched. I moved to Gloucester when I was in first grade. We used to live in Western Mass. And I really struggled with all the connections and peers I had felt at home with. I, my mother ended up having to work at Fuller, <laughs> is basically how that ended. Um, but it was a real tough time when all your peers, you're joining a group of peers that have nearly grown up together. They see these kids they see in school more than some kids outside of school and family. And then I just felt plopped in there and felt a little disconnected and it was tough for me. So I just wanted to add that speaking from my own personal experience being moved at, and that was first grade that I came here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Deanna Benjamin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so I live on Briarwood Court. My children go to Plum Cove and O'Malley. I'm actually the PTO president at Plum Cove. This doesn't impact my children, but just hearing the mothers in the families of the Plum Cove students night breaks my heart. You know, we are a very close knit community. Amy helps tremendously. She's running all our enrichment right now. Um, and she would be a huge loss as would pretty much any of these students and these children and as i'm sure you heard tonight they're visibly upset about it i guess um you know ben when you and i met a few weeks ago there wasn't a three-year timeline in place so this sort of just came up it was brought to my attention yesterday when a couple of parents had reached out so i guess i would would be hoping for a little bit more clarification and transparency on on how the three years was discussed and determined. Um, I don't know if there's a better solution, five years, three years, whatever it is, but if they could just get a better understanding as to why it's three years. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, anybody else want to speak? We have Jill. Same men address for the record, please. Um, I live at five Samuel Riggs Circle, and um, my daughter is a first grader at Plum Cove. I'm also part of the Plum Cove PTO. I'm the secretary. So can you um, have your last name, please? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, you. Yeah, Beba, B-E-B-A. -B -E -B um, I just, I, <clears throat> I just wanted to bring up too that um, not only the children who would have to move schools, like how they're impacted, but also the children who would be staying at Plum, and you know, losing these friendships and connections with people. Um, just for an example, we were at a birthday party this weekend for one of the Plum Cove students. And I think we just in conversation identified around nine or 10 kids in a single first grade, grade classroom that would be impacted by this change. And I mean, that's pretty significant um, for kids who, you know, have spent the past year and a half adjusting to a new school, building friendships, you know, finding where they fit. Um, in the school community. So I think just taking that into consideration that it's not just impacting those students that 
would need to move, but it's also impacting the students that would be staying. That's it. Okay, thank you, Jill. No one else has their hand raised. Anybody else would like to speak? Okay. Um, we will close the public hearing. I will mention that you are also welcome to send in any written comments to us at school committee at gloucesterschools.com. Um, so you're welcome to do that as well. That will reach all the members. Okay, so that closes the public hearing. Um, so there's discussion on this, but we're not we're not discussing this topic tonight. That's how we're voting next week. Um, some discussion on the on the agenda. Yeah, I don't know why it's there. Okay. It shouldn't be there. If there are questions you want me to answer, I can answer the questions now. Okay. Can I just sure. ask, are we voting on this next week? That's what that's what it's schedule. Been scheduled. Yeah. Yeah. I know I have requested the superintendent for our next week to be prepared. So I don't know that I want to I don't need to discuss it now, but I don't know what other people want to say. I just have a just in terms of next week. I don't know, I'm assuming you have these numbers, but do you could you prepare or present? how many siblings of current students are going to be impacted by this change. Did you already do that? I mean, I understand your request. How many siblings, say, say more, because, because so like, like, we don't know if they're not in school yet. We don't know if they exist. Right. Or do you mean of like- Is there like, a way like that example we can get that information, I guess is what I want to know. So somebody sort of asked like, how many siblings of current students would be impacted by this what, what change? We're, what, we're, what we're able to get, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to get that information. We, we don't have any access to that. So, but, but we, of this same top, same sort of uh, area, we certainly would know how many students um, who are kindergarten or first have older students. You know, we, we can do some of that in terms of who's already enrolled. Right. And we also may also be able to do it in terms of um, increasing students as well. Mm -hmm. That's what we yeah. So, yeah, I wasn't sure if in the personal conversations that people were having, if that was part of the questions that we were asking, like if they had additional students. Yeah, no, we, 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 no we, we, we asked, yes, we asked that, you know, then they could, they could list out which ones they did. Not many folks did that, okay. you know, but they had that option. Um, uh, and, and, and so uh, we, we didn't initially start with that question, but then we added it. And so I think that one of the 30 folks who responded about uh, 20 who had that option. Um, so, uh, and then of course, yeah, but so that, that's, I think the best we can do in terms of siblings is ones who are already enrolled, um, do they have, you know, and we also have numbers of, you know, how many first um, of all the streets, okay, that impact those three slides. We already have, you know, how many first, how many first and second graders are on the streets, how many kindergarten, sorry, first, kindergarten and first graders are on the streets, and then how many preschoolers are on the streets. So we have that, let me share that to you. Yeah. Well, but that doesn't give us siblings. Right. Because you know, the siblings here, you know, you know, when you have a, say, a, a third grader and a kindergarten, or a third grader, a third grader and a preschooler, you know, that's, I think, the most difficult piece of family, which I understand. You know, I mean, I'm just sort of want to acknowledge that that's where it gets, and that's where we have to sit down with each family and really talk through them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that, when you have that split over and younger, right, is, is the most difficult situation that folks have to sit down. And you know preschool that go to Gloucester preschool. Just Gloucester preschool, just Gloucester preschool, exactly right. right. And of course, that's that's you know, a, um, a a small, not a small, but it's a certain you know, it's a percentage mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, of how many folks are preschool in the because we, we get folks from a whole bunch of preschools as you Right. Also, kids who aren't in preschool too. So. Awesome. so, in preparation for next week. I have a lot of concern. Um, I know this has been scheduled the way that it has on the agenda, but I really feel the frustration of coming to this decision quick for some families, knowing that there's a lot of, not necessarily unknowns, because I, I give great kudos to our administration for the outreach that you're doing currently to 
to reach out to families and try to get their opinions and get their concerns addressed. But the comment, some of the comments I heard tonight, I think um, there's a festering of, of, I don't even know if that's the right word, festering, is that a word? <laughs> it's not a great I don't think word. I've ever used that word before. It is tonight. <laughs> there's, there's a bubbling, you know, it, it just seems that this topic is bringing in other topics. Like for the first speaker example, it brought in um, talking about our curriculum, yeah. um, what did we do for all the schools? Curriculum mapping, we called it when we did it 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Um, so I, ju I just feel like that this topic is so sensitive. It, it's, it's bringing up a lot of emotions for families and rightfully so. And I'm trying to stay focused on the actual moving of students, not necessarily the issues of um, what our um, student growth is and things like that, because I think those are other conversations that we have through your plans, your excellent plans that we have going forward. So um, one of my questions to you next week is gonna be, and it was brought up several times tonight, is this three-year plan. I mean, I, I feel like we're stuck on three and I don't know that three is the right answer. And I'd like you to expand and maybe think of four or five for just some families and to kind of define grandfathering maybe in a different way. You mentioned that it's only, that it's 15% of families, which is a lot of families because one family impacted is emotional and, and is worth the conversation. But I, I can't help but wonder that if we redesign the word grandfathering for that 15% as it is this year, if that would help going forward in determining whether this is a three-year plan, five-year plan or whatever, for those families that do have the kindergarten and the fifth grade student in the same school. I am a supporter of not wanting to push kindergarten and first graders to a new school. I feel like if they've started that school and they want to stay at that school, that they should have that right. Because there is a lot of camaraderie in the neighborhoods and in the families and reasons why students um, go to certain schools to be with their friends in their neighborhoods and things like that too. And that whole siblings issue is a whole nother conversation to, for me to confirm, not even to do all this, if it's breaking up families. So I just know that I'm gonna be coming into next week with, a, with an expectation that we're thinking outside of more than what was presented tonight, if we're gonna be pushed to make that decision next week. Otherwise, I think we're pushing this too quick. But I also recognize that the timeline is important for the beginning of school next year. Yeah, so I'm trying to balance that. But the fact that we really haven't had a lot of discussion, and I feel like we're really going to hack this out next week, and then all of a sudden we're making a decision. It's almost like I need another time to think, time to think about yeah. it. But that's so, so just where I'm going. So, so for fifteen percent is uh, of of our students. Fifteen percent of them live on those all in infected streets. But of course, you know, less, it's less than that who are who are, who are affected. Right. Because not all not all the children on all the streets are affected. Right. I do want to say this and just be clear, and then also. Because someone raised this, and it's important that that we talk a limited number, meaning it's a it's a it's it's not across the whole district, okay, across the whole city. But again and again, I, I want to reiterate to everyone who's listening and families that that you know it's a giant, it's a really big impact on any families who have to switch their kids, okay, like that, like very seriously. Like I think you understand that, we understand that, and that's the reason we're trying to have you know uh, transition, of course. We're trying to do it for as a small group of, of, of streets as possible because we do appreciate that it's a big impact. And, and especially um, if it's you know one or two families, we understand like for each family, it's a big deal. And you never want to minimize that. I want folks to you know, hear that and understand that really clearly um, and, 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 and take that very seriously. Um, and so, and so I just want to make sure everyone knows that from us, from you folks who I'm speaking for you, but uh, especially myself, our principals, um, we really get that. It's, it's very difficult. And I just want to say, as you're saying this, it just brings me, I just have to put this out to everybody. It brings me back to the first conversation we had when you became our superintendent and we sat outside and talked. I could feel your compassion for this community and all the issues come forward in that conversation. I'll never forget it. So I know you are 100% in this issue and not locked into anything and want to do what's right for family. So I appreciate that a lot. And, and, and thank you very much, folks. I mean, it means a lot. And that's the only reason that you know we're reaching out to folks to make sure they, they know and understand it. They have a variety of ways to make sure their concerns are heard. And then we're having 
in the convert into this conversation, you know, because because um, we do want to um, you know make what something difficult as, as as best as possible for us. You know, it's, it's difficult. Thank you. I just want to piggyback on that also in terms of um, um, the the idea of grandfathering as it relates to um, transportation versus enrollment, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where the school choice conversation comes in. And how does that help us get to a place? Um, because we can't continue to have extra stops on our buses forever. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a, a situation that you won't, you know, that um, will probably complicate things in the transportation department if we continue and continue for the next um, sibling after sibling after sibling. But enrollment is different. We do know we have school choice where there's some um, transportation put, you know, by the family. So we don't want to, um, you know, and there may be equi equity things with respect to who can and can't transport their own kid also. But um, you know, who knows what arrangements families would make if that's what they would want for their child to stay where they are. Um, so, Kathy, can I just sort of clarify that just to make sure I understand? So, so asking to the administration to look at the possibility of allowing people to stay where they are, but not necessarily offer transportation uh, full time. Is that what you're saying? That's what, yeah, 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 right. That's something to explore. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I kind of when the conversation started, that, that was my. The initial question was, well, what's the process for us discussing this? But it's kind of morphed into that now, so I'm, which I'm totally comfortable with. Um, one of the things I wrote down is, only because I was writing fast, do a better job of talk, talking about the programs that we're implementing, like uh, you know, the pilot programs, and make people more comfortable about making the switch. You know, if they're if they if, if that's what is ultimately determined, and. There's a few people I talked to over the past couple of days. It was I ended up myself talking about the program and saying, "Boy, we're really doing some great stuff from a curriculum level, you know, on the curriculum level at the elementary schools. Some of these pilot programs have really taken off and they're very engaging." And I was confident talking about that being mitigated across all the schools. And uh, so I, I think, to me. You know, it comes down a lot to A, not rushing into it, and B, making people comfortable. I think one of the parents mentioned, you know, mentioned just that. Hey, what are we doing? You know, what can you do to almost guarantee that what, what's going to what's going to happen at Beeman is what we need? And uh, maybe we have, maybe we need to step that up a little bit. So, just a thought. Yeah, I think, you know, one. So can I respond to that? Yeah, I mean, um, what what. Many families don't know, and I would expect them to know this. Okay, right. and, and 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 you know we've done we helped you got the school to learn these over the last year or so is is over the last six or seven years, our elementary schools have done a tremendous job implementing the same curriculum, working from the same page, having the same practices around individualized support. I mean these things are already in existence. But one of the um, you know one of the members of the public um, will raise concern about that, but that's but that's something actually that that. Gloucester has done. Yeah. You know, We've been talking about it. Yeah, and, 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 and it's, I mean, and our teachers have done. You know, and, and so you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, if we were having this conversation about about this sort of change, um, families would really, um, and, and the school committee would actually, you know, would you know, be absolutely right to to raise those questions of differences. But at this point, the curriculum, instruction, the practices around understanding how kids are doing on an individual basis, special education practices. You know, so again, not that schools are all the same, okay? They're different because they have different teachers and different students and families, okay? And that's great, that's important. But in terms of those practices, we're very much on the same page, and that's a huge strength of lost, right? Um, it doesn't, I'm not trying to set up, say people shouldn't have concerns or be concerned with their families, but that's something that, that the school's going to pay job on. And I, just to not rebuttal the superintendent, but just yeah. to say, I totally agree with that, yeah. but I wouldn't have known that unless I was on the school committee. Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so that's one of the things in terms of our outreach and engagement, right. especially, so for example, for with, for with, with the new ELA curriculum, we'll be doing some parent forums on that. For example, tonight <laughs> was a um, K-5 um, math forum. 
you know, for folks as well. You know, or planning to do it, do the same thing on, on, on the same night. But but we'll do more of that parent education around you know what's happening in your school, in our schools, approach on curriculum, that sort of stuff. Um, and I, so that's that's I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Can I ask what time you do in these forums? What time of day? Um, I don't. There was one from eleven to twelve today, and then one in the evening. There was two. So what is evening? Thank you. I think I think six, six to seven sure. or seven to eight, one of those two. But there, there's one, one thing I've learned is there's no perfect time to do anything. Yeah. So you try to do it at the right times and hope, hope you hit, hit best. But I think it's a good approach for the math one during one during one during the school day, yeah. you know, one uh, in the evening. Uh, but evenings, evenings are always hard for families. No it was time. virtual. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. I work from home, husband. I made it. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I can I can take no credit for that. that, would, that Good for be, our district yeah, for doing that. Would be our, our math coaches, um, <laughs> uh, probably Greg Bach as well. Um, can I, I take no credit for that? So bring that up next time under recognitions, yeah. so <laughs> that we can get that word out that we are. I mean, I just think these curriculum forums yeah. are so important. Yeah, and I know we've had some in the past, but it's nice to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, the advertisement. Go ahead. Um, in just in conversations that I've had with peers, um, sending their kids to school, I've talked to quite a few that haven't sent their kids to school yet. Right? They have, they'll have kindergarten next year or the year, year after. And as you can see, we didn't really have any concerns from those parents. I think across the board. Um, I mean, I can't. This is sort of a blanket statement, but in the conversations that I had, people aren't really concerned about sending their kid to a different school if they haven't already started right, right. because they're confident that our schools are doing a good job sort of across the board. But, you know, with my parent hat on who is gonna have a kindergartner and a second grader next year, I can feel the pain here, right? Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine what it would be like to sort of switch a community um, and make that change for, my, for myself, for my kids. And so for the current families is where I really have concern. Um, and I think, as we can see, that's that's the biggest issue here. And I want to make sure we're doing everything that we can to accommodate them, um, because it's the families who aren't currently in the district that we're not hearing from. They don't seem to have a lot of concerns. It's the ones who are really, yeah. who are already here, who are already invested in their communities. And so I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support them. Okay. So I think there were some, some requests in. So let me just so make sure I have those questions. So, so students and students um, uh, in, in the younger grades, siblings where we know know of them. Yeah, and, and yeah. can I just say, like, and families, if you're listening, if you have younger children, if please include that in an email to us so that we just understand, like, what's the breadth in terms of like the impact on your individual families. Um, the form is up there as well. It's another way to, uh, addition, um, yeah. to, to, to make sure we know what you're thinking and your concerns. Um, the 15%, I'll dig into that a little more deeply. Um, uh, talk with, uh, I think, I think um, I'll, I'll talk, talk over the, the three years, the transition trans trans period. Um, but that's, that's a place that, you know, you guys are going to have to really dig into some, dig in a little bit and really talk, talk that through, hash that out. Um, grandfathering. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't matter. Three years, their grandfathering. I, I can talk more about but that. But also, well. what grandfathering means to mean different things. Like what? What is being? <coughs> so, so what we mean is 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 what I laid out on this slide, the transition slide. That's you can eliminate the word grandfathering and just use the three-year transition. Okay, but I can't see more questions about that or explain the rationale. That's more. Um, If you have additional requests, please copy all the committee members so they know that we know what they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so essentially, the um, updating of school attendance zones, um, we're allowed to do this as a school committee, depending on these three criteria. Are we just um, opening of a new school is essentially the <coughs> we don't have an okay. crowded school. That's, per, that's the precipitating factor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, we can focus on that more than say like. You know, social, socio-economic uh, ramifications. 
you know, I think we can concentrate on just like fulfilling the enrollment for the new school, you know, because um, we're going to be just the East Gloucester and, and Vets together wouldn't like fill up that school. Right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. But that has to be, that's like point number one. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the precipitous, uh, precipitate, um, yeah. precipitating factor. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. You were going to talk about uh, in response to Marion Boucher's the uh, oh, yeah those things coming right. So so I sort of skipped over those slides tonight, but as I said last time, you know, I met with the planning director um, uh, and then talked through the different um, pieces. Um, uh, let me just talk for my slides. And I, I'm not purporting to be an expert on zoning or projecting housing, okay, at all. Um, but in terms of what we learned was that um, there, there are four possible developments in the West Paris zone, but those are sort of um, in various forms of, um, of process. And the process goes from everything from it's someone's idea to um, permitting, and then also you can throw litigation as well. And, and those four uh, possible, um, you know, it's, it's up to 100, uh, four different possible development um, efforts. Um, it could be up to 100 family, 100 family style housing, but those are three to five years or more, and um, and it is unknown and difficult to project whether that would be second second homes for folks, um, whether that would be vacation homes for folks, whether that would be um, you know um, empty nesters or families with young children. And it can be any and all of those. Okay, and that's why um, with a possible growth there. Um, that's why I'm not concerned with West Parish being under enrolled. Okay, if it's, if it's going to happen anywhere in, in Gloucester these days, it's going to be growth there. Okay, in terms of the MBTA community's <coughs> impact, um, that's primarily downtown. Um, but in terms of, and we don't know, we don't know if Gloucester is going to be involved in that at this point or not. Okay, we're not sure the city council has, has a real significant role in that. Okay, um, and th those impacts with large, if any, would be downtown. Um, and uh, it does create um, a possibility for higher density downtown, uh, but again, uh, likely to be um, smaller places. Um, if we just look at uh, Halyard, which is the most recent large development in the city, we have a total of, I think it's four students that have come from that development. And it's a very large one. It's a similar type you might see downtown, one bedroom, two bedroom, okay? So um, I think that uh, in talking to a uh, plan director, it's um, you know, it's it's not clear that um, there's going to be any any immediate uh, any immediate or short term impact. I will say this: um, if there is between Beeman and and uh, West Gloucester, sorry, Beeman, EGS Beth School, and West Parish, capacity is not a problem. Capacity is not. We have we have small class sizes, um, and capacity is not an issue in our schools. And, uh, and, uh, and I think one thing too on that line is, you know, when we when we closed Fuller School, we did redistricting or rezoning or replacement, whatever you want yeah. to call it, way back then. And that was 11, 12 years ago. Had to be 13. 13. That was <laughs> Lucky you. Was I was there. And it was ugly. Yeah. But my point is, any anytime we have this conversation, it's going to be ugly because you're dealing with emotions and families that... Um, sometimes get pushed to make changes that they don't want to make. But I think of the footprint back then and where it is now, I, I think um, it wouldn't be, I don't, I don't know how wise it would be to try to predict what's going to happen with the developments in Gloucester because you just don't know. And it's you could not have predicted where we are now 10 years ago um, when we made those decisions back then. We thought for sure the way we were dividing up the city, even though it didn't make sense, which you're struggling with now because you're looking at this map and like, how did you get here? Well, it was because we were trying to resolve similar problems like we are now, only we just had to change the boundaries and the way we did it because of where people lived. Now here we are. I think you were on the committee when we did that with Jonathan, um, that redistricting. We only did the, the East Gloucester over enrollment. Okay, so it was the full event when yeah. we did it. Um, so we're, we're actually having the same conversation we did back then mm -hmm. to try to fix the same issues. It just looks different on the map. And 10 years from now, it's probably going to look different as well. So I understand the concerns with the development that's 
could, could, should, would, may happen. But um, I think the decisions that we are making really have to be for, for where we are now as well, knowing that there is capacity in most of the schools to expand. We're just trying to keep smaller classes. So. That's exactly right. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, that concludes. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mr. Minio. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Jeff Rosen Clancy. Yes. And Ms. Hall. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Huh? Last one.